Well, thank you very much, and thanks again to the organisers for inviting me to speak here. So um, I'm going to speak about medical aspects of the travelling athlete. And uh, what I'm really happy about is that uh, this isn't an audience only of team physicians in this room because the team physicians are really the last people you need to convince about the kind of issues that I'm going to be speaking about. I'm really happy that there are coaches here as well and that there are hopefully some administrators because a lot of my experience as both uh, Chief Medical Officer for Olympic athletes and Paralympic athletes has been trying to get the administrators to understand that they form a very important part of the team looking after the health of the athlete. So travel, I need you to substitute the word load instead of travel because travel constitutes a significant load on the athlete. So if one thinks of the travel experience, which is very important because this is how we get to our destinations to train and race, constitutes as big a load, if not more, than it is when we do training. The second concept that I want to bring home is something called marginal gains. And it pains me as a South African to speak about rugby uh, here at this time in history because we're not doing very well. But we know, and this was a very famous uh, uh, loss of ours in a semi-final of one of the World Cups, that success is a matter of inches in these sports. And in fact, if that wing would have tackled the number 11 just a fraction of a second earlier or been a pound heavier and the momentum carrying that number 11 could have been slightly to the side, things might have been extremely different. But I don't think there's a sport that can actually demonstrate this better than is the case of swimming. That marginal gains and split split seconds in swimming are incredibly important and are the difference between a gold and a silver or even a bronze and no medal whatsoever. So what I'm going to be saying about the concept of travel is to do with marginal gains. That if we can take a group of seemingly small measures and put them together and get a marginal gain then we would be doing our athletes a very great service in achieving top in elite sport. So a couple of other very important concepts. Sick and injured athletes do not perform. They just don't. As Margot said, you can have a four-year cycle. That's fantastic, but you comes an illness or an injury on that day, you won't perform. We do whatever we can to look for small marginal gains. The strategy that ensuring that athletes are healthy is not only the job of the medical team, but it's the entire administration and support staff. So my approach is to actually include the administration team into the medical team when discussing all of these issues relating to uh, travel. And in fact, the dealing with the travel and putting these uh, issues in place is a way of being. It's a way of living, it's a culture within the team. So I'm going to speak about two things. Number one, does it work? What are the risks of training? And then I'm going to leave you with some very practical four slides of guidelines for your teams and for your swimmers that will actually do the best for them uh, when they travel. So I'm going to show you some uh, data that one of my students has been looking at, and that's looking at illness at the London 2012 Paralympic Games and looking at country clusters. And this graph uh, or this picture shows you all illnesses per thousand athlete days uh, over the various continents. And I'm going to try and answer the question of, is there a home advantage? when you have a game situation. So the first thing I want to point out is that the, we're missing data from the Australians and from the Chinese who never shared the data with us in uh, London, but in Rio they did, so we'll let them off the hook. But I don't have those data uh, ready. But have a look at this data and you can see that uh, the UK um, in London um, has a all illness rate of 12.1. And that is only done better by the Eastern European area and by North America. And higher than those all illnesses are the continents of Africa, 
and uh, South America. And I was very interested in actually exploring Ac Africa more because I wanted to see what my region of sub-Saharan Africa actually is the worst. We have the highest incidence of illness in a Olympic or Paralympic setting. Uh, and this clearly shows that where prevention programs need to be focused, and it's in the countries that are perhaps the poorer countries that take the brunt um, of the traveling. But remember in my last talk, I spoke quite a lot about respiratory illness. And now have a look at the home advantage when it comes to respiratory illnesses. And there we see the UK with a respiratory illness rate of 1.3 per thousand athlete days and very much more, significantly more, in all the other parts of the world. So the question is, is that, is this the home advantage? And is this just travel that induces respiratory illness? Or is it perhaps something interesting that the team, the medical team of GB did with the London Olympic and Paralympic Games? Incidentally, these are GIT illnesses as well, and you can see that there's uh, 1.9 in the UK, uh, 1.3 in North America, 1.5 in the rest of Europe, and again we see higher in Africa and in South America. So what I'm going to speak about is I'm going to make a brief, a few comments about jet lag, then speaking about illness when traveling, looking at the epidemiology and risk factors. I've spoken about the common illnesses already, so I'm not going to say much more. I'm going to speak about the team physician and what we as team physicians can actually do in preparing for the challenges of travel, uh, both before the journey at the destination and after the journey. So the first is the, the load of travel with respect to crossing time zones or not crossing time zones. And there are two types of travel loads or travel fatigue that can be induced. The one is the general travel fatigue that comes from long haul or even not so long haul travel when you do not travel in east, west and cross time zones. That is called just travel fatigue or simple travel fatigue. And the data show that that is even if you travel as little as 500 kilometers. That's got to do with the stress of being in an airport environment, the stress of getting onto a plane, off a plane and traveling to a hotel or whatever. But even that can cause fatigue. But a much more profound disturbance of the homeostasis of the body is when one uh, gets a jet lag, when one travels either east or west from a certain uh, destination. And we know that there are zeitgeibers or time givers in the body that register where we are. And these work in a circadian and allow our circadian rhythms. And that's mostly sunlight and our response uh, with respect to our melatonin. There are others, for example, our physical activity patterns, our temperatures and the meals that we have. But sunlight is the main one. And sunlight inhibits the release of melatonin and requires a significant amount of exposure time to bright light uh, as that time giver. And that changes as we travel uh, either east-west or west-east. So w the team physician must learn about this. And this still remains a, a very good summary of jet lag. There's some nice interesting pharmacological compounds that are in pr uh, production at the moment to deal with jet lag. But many of the team physicians right around the world still rely on melatonin and phase advancement structures and manipulation of light and dark in order to overcome jet lag. So if one has a look then at the various different competitions that are done uh, across the world and have a look at the rates of uh, illnesses, this is some work that um, my colleague Martin Schwellness and myself did over a number of years where we looked at various different competitions and you can see short duration competitions of less than four weeks and going from the left side of the slide we see the FINA World Championship, some of Margot's data from 2009, then we have a look at the Winter Olympic Games, Summer Olympic Games, then we start looking at the uh, IAAF World Championships and we see that there's actually a standard set rate for these short duration competitions. Then you'll see a blip uh, in the green, which is the 2010 FIFA World Cup. And then you'll see another blip, which is the 2012 Summer Paralympic Games. 
And what's different about those, particularly the FIFA World Cup, is that this is a longer competition. So the longer the athlete is away from home, the greater risk of illness there is. So the clinical observation is that one can expect athletes to become ill at a rate of half a percent of all athletes in your team per day of the tournament. So you can start anticipating what kind of uh, uh, stress as a medical physician you're going to experience with ill athletes. So our next job was to actually go and determine what happens then with even longer competitions. And the model that we used to look at is something called the Super Rugby Competition, which is a Southern Hemisphere rugby competition which was played between the teams of South Africa, Australia and New Zealand. It now includes Argentina and it includes Singapore as well. So we wanted to have a look at what is the amount of illness in these teams as they start traveling around the world. And does international travel increase the incidence of illness in the 16-week tournament? So we recruited 259 elite rugby players from eight teams, and we followed them up through a study of 22,600 player days. And what we did is we just established a baseline in illness in the three time periods. The first was before traveling, then secondly, after travel, when you travel more than five time zones, and then on return, when you uh, travel back to your home country. And this could be east-west or west-east. So all of these rugby players undertake first line, their baseline um, evaluation. And the incidence of illness per thousand player days was 15.4. Now look what happens when you travel away from home. As you cross more than five time zones, you more than double your incidence of illness. But look what happens now when you travel back at the end of the competition. On return, it goes down to less than that with the baseline. So what does this mean? This means that the athlete is at risk not only when they cross the time zones, but specifically when they cross time zones going to the competition. And that risk is not there when they cross the same time zones going back home again. So we have to be aware of higher risk periods for illness. It's the destination that is the problem, and not the travel per se. The team physician has to know the expected illnesses and types of illnesses, which I've already spoken about. And the team physician has to go and know the destination. They need to know the altitude, the pollution, the allergens, and the food. We have to know what athletes, if our athletes are ill before they leave, we need to screen them specifically for respiratory illnesses or dermatological screening. We need to have a vaccination program. And I'm going to speak about the other things that the Team GB did in order to see that their illnesses were at a minimum. We need to plan our medical support before we leave, establish contact with medical colleagues in the destination countries, particularly with respect to things like filling prescriptions and getting back up from that. And then the big thing with travel is education, education, education of the coaches, of the team, of the athletes themselves, and as well as the administrators with respect to things like what foods to eat, when to eat them, how to eat them, to report symptoms early. We know that uh, the athletes report symptoms late and also about per personal hygiene. So what does one do before the journey? Again, it comes down to money. It is very good for the Federation to actually spend a bit of money sending the doctor for a scoping visit to go and see what the problems are in the destination to travel. We can't just bring in certain medications that we would, would we want to. So, for example, pain management. There are various different rules and regulations regarding drugs that I would use on a daily basis for pain management in South Africa that you can't take in to certain countries. Those of you who are working with athletes with disability have to do an airline course for adapted travel to actually know if someone runs into a problem with getting out of a chair or being locked in a toilet, how to actually undo those locks. There are ways of manipulating aeroplane seats that you would never believe. You can get any seat to recline. Um, I remember that patient, uh, or athletes with impairment load the plane one hour before and one hour after everybody else uh, gets into the plane. 
watch for delays on connecting flights in, in looking after para-athletes. We usually lose athletes, particularly athletes who are slower, athletes with CP or intellectually impaired athletes go missing often. Um, to organize again with the airlines before the time for a set number of free upgrades and to use those with athletes who are extra tall or who have high needs. And access is always a main challenge. So this is my checklist that I would go to a country and look at. You'd want to know what altitude and how one prepares the athletes for the various altitude that uh, is going to be at the host city. What are the temperatures there? Am I going to be very cold or very hot? What allergens are there? And if we have highly allergic athletes and we skin test our athletes before we leave, does one need to go on a prophylaxis program of allergy management before they get there, particularly if they're going to a place like Australia? Atmospheric pollution. Ultraviolet radiation, particularly if one's going to be in exposed areas. Access if you are going to be dealing with athletes with impairment and then food and water quality. We know, for example, as we heard about yesterday in Margot's lecture about exercise-induced bronchospasm and allergic rhinitis, that particularly some countries are known for their allergens. So, for example, I mentioned Australia with their grasses and trees. That's a typical problem for uh, South African athletes going into that area, uh, particularly in springtime. Now, I'll show you this, and um, this is an athlete. Can anybody spot what's wrong with that athlete? Yes, they're mouth breathing. So we train our athletes actually to, if you're sharing a room with another athlete, just have a look at your buddy to make sure they're not mouth breathing. Because this mouth breathing is not a benign condition. If you're mouth breathing, it means that you're bypassing your nose. So you're bypassing your, walk, uh, your heating mechanisms, you're bypassing your filter system, and you're dumping allergens directly into the lungs. And this is if you don't man manage allergies properly when you're traveling, and this athlete has got allergic rhinitis, what happens if you bypass breathe, you don't go into your deep or slow wave sleep, and when that happens, you get immunological problems and you don't get recovery, and your sleep is your main recovery mechanism. So just an interesting thing to bring into the attention of the team and the athletes to look out for bypass breathing. We would typically get a geographical depiction of pollen calendars. This is what our pollen calendar for South Africa looks like. And this was important for the World Cup when we prepared to, this information to give to the team physicians. We also have a look at the different um, uh, pollutions to actually see what our athletes are going to be exposed to there, both in chemical and non-chemical pollutants. And we use the WHO guidelines for each pollutant. Ultraviolet, again, uh, depends where the athletes are going to. We know in South Africa and we know in Australia, those are where the holes in the ozone layers are. The sun is particularly dangerous in those areas and we advise the athletes accordingly. During the journey, uh, usual movement guidelines, the avoidance of uh, alcohol, advise on hydration and nutrition. And remember an anti-infection protocol, which I'm going to speak about now, for those of you traveling with athletes with impairment, get them to remove their prosthetic devices while they travel and keep the liners on. Remember that stump is going to move 10 to 30 percent. and We want to inhibit that movement, otherwise we're going to have stump socket problems and assist athletes to the bathroom and back. As far as the journey home goes, my advice is to leave as soon as possible. My busiest day ever as a team physician was after competition. In one day, I had alcohol, sunburn, lacerations, unprotected intercourse, and sprained ankle, all in the same athlete. <laughs> Don't ask how the, athlete, how the ankle sprain came about. Uh, but the point is, is that the, as a team physician, only bad things happen after competition is finished. So get the, the administrators to get the team out of there as soon as possible. Remember that when one gets back home, diseases can manifest uh, at home after competition, and we lose touch with a lot of our athletes. For example, if we go to a malaria area, malaria only presents itself a week or 10 days after one's back, and just, uh, one has to again educate the athletes. 
counselling to continue medications. We've placed them on, for example, tetracyclines. Uh, new symptoms might be related to travel, so beware the single thick leg or swollen leg for an aircraft-induced or travel-induced DVT, and uh, that might be important. So let me share with you some of the infection control and prevention mechanisms that Team GB and uh, my good friend uh, Dr. Nick Webborn uh, instituted in his team. The first thing he did is he got them to embody this concept of that, guys, we're all in this together. We want medals as an outcome. Everybody, whether you're a coach, administrator, or athlete, doctor, you all buy into this and becomes the culture. The culture of hand hygiene, the culture of probiotics, and the culture of time is vaccination, testing for allergies, and so on and so forth. And it might be an ache to do at the time, but guys, this is what is going to help us win at the end of the day. So, what were the infection control prevention measures? So, this is a substance called First Defense, uh, just a simple thing of hand hygiene and getting the mainstay of minimizing the spread of infections, washing hands uh, with some of these substances, particularly if there's a substance called Biotrol in it, actually gives you a residual film for up to eight hours afterwards. So if you do wash your hands once or wipe your hands with a substance like First Defense that has Biotrol in it, it will keep you uh, safe for a, a number of hours. And here's a picture of Team GB. And just have a look there that that's at the welcome reception desk. They've got the First Defense actually embedded in the culture there. Second thing is probiotics, and I was very happy to see that FINA in this meeting seems to be sponsored by Yakult. And um, there's some work by Mike Gleason from the UK, which shows that a daily probiotic, uh, in fact, Lactobacillus casei Shirota, reduces the incidence of infection in athletes. So there's scientific evidence that um, the probiotics uh, do work. And this is a nice, tasty thing. Again, it was every athlete every day that was having uh, this. It was totally inculcated uh, in the team. There are a few uh, suggestions. If you're going to try probiotics, try uh, before and not just in the games time. Uh, take a good supply of these or make sure. Uh, this particular brand, which is Yakult, uh, can't be consumed by anybody with allergy to dairy products. And it's made from skin milk. Uh, cow skin milk and therefore is not suitable for vegans, it's also not kosher, but there are many very different other uh, probiotics that are w uh, um, very good, uh, some of them multiple strains uh, that can be used well. Uh, Nick also had a very strong approach to urinary tract infections. Every athlete, every day, had a urine culture. If you were uh, a wheelchair user, remember the wheelchair users? Uh, when you're working with the rim of your wheel that uh, has been in the village, uh, there's all kinds of things on the roads, there's dog poo there, you get that on your hands, and then you need to self catheterize. So the urinary tract infections are a big problem. Every athlete, every day, gave a urine specimen to go and have a look for bacteria. If there were bacteria at higher counts, you'd do a sensitivity and put that athlete before uh, early intervention onto correct antibiotics. So if you want to know that hometown advantage, yes, that does account. But just look at what Team GB were able to do with this kind of change in their culture of the um, adapting a fight against infection. So in leaving you with my last four slides, I'm going to show you what the latest thinking of is in, in terms of what we can do as a team to minimize uh, our illness. And this is very hot off the press. This was in the September edition of the BJSM. Uh, it was a consensus by the IOC. It was headed by my colleague Martin Schwellness. And what I've done is I've summarized this article for you in, um, in four slides. So there are a whole lot of practical strategies that you can do that are behavioral, lifestyle, and medical. So here they are. Number one, minimize contact with infected people and young kids if you are taking a team. Avoid crowded areas. Avoid shaking hands outside of the team environment. Keep a distance from sneezes. 
If you see somebody sneezing or coughing into their hand, tell them that's old-fashioned. They must now cough into their elbow, like you see that lady doing. That's, that's called elbow coughing and elbow sneezing. And what that does is it just cuts down. You don't shake hands with people's elbows. You shake hands with their hands. Wash hands regularly and use a gel. And if it's got biotrol in it, then it lasts for a long time. Carry insect repellent. If you are in an area which uh, has um, the uh, insects, particularly malarial mosquitoes, don't share drinks. Towels, and that's uh, obviously something that can be particularly relevant to the swimming community, and cutlery. Take beverages from sealed bottles, and if you don't wash it and don't peel it, then don't eat it. Wear open footwear when using public showers, and that's also important. We know that any inflammatory response, even if it's an athlete's foot, that you get a systematic ultrasensitive C-reactive protein raised from Allows, has an effect on the immune system. Good quality sleep, uh, employ strategic napping, all of that uh, works and is important. Avoid alcohol, especially binge drinking. Uh, we know that there is evidence that binge drinking impairs immune function. Practice safe sex and use condoms. Good, some more. Don't take sick athletes on tour. Sick athletes have no place in a touring squad. They will infect others, and the same is the same for officials. No sick officials, doctors, coaches go on tour. Develop, implement, and monitor illness prevention guidelines for athletes and support staff. Screen for airway inflammatory diseases. We screen also for the um, skin allergies with skin prick testing. This is an interesting one. Identify high-risk athletes and use full precautions during high-risk periods. We know it's the same athletes that tend to get sick time and time again. They are what we call poor travelers. And we know that those are the people that we need to be extra careful with. Um, single room accommodation for high-risk athletes with high loads. And also these athletes who travel badly. So I cannot tell you how in my career my fight has been there just to get one spare isolation room. And you know, people still don't want to spend the money on that isolation room. You can't look at this marginal gains theory and say that it is a waste of money if you're going to have a marginal gain and get a medal in one athlete for that one room. So get a spare room, isolate early, isolate not only athletes but isolate officials as well. Protect the airway from very cold uh, temperatures during strenuous exercise. A good vaccination program, five to seven weeks. Remember, some of these vaccines take that long to kick in. Remember to do it early because the coaches get very upset when it's close because you lose 24 to 48 hours after vaccination because the uh, athletes can't train in that period of time. Update the admin and support staff vaccines again. There's some evidence that zinc lozenges of more than 75 milligrams of high ionic zinc content, if you take at the onset of an upper respiratory tract infection, decreases the number of days of that infection and early identification isolation of sick staff. Ron's covered a bit of this, uh, but I'll just uh, go through them. Introduce personalized nutrition programs to avoid deficiencies ingest carbohydrate during and after exercise, and both carbohydrate and protein after exercise, measure and monitor vitamin D status. I've spoken about the probiotics. Uh, consider advising athletes on regular consumption of fruits and plants with polyphenol supplements, for example, quercetin, or food substances, for example, non-alcoholic beer or green tea that may reduce the risk of illness. In the last slide, um, is that we need ongoing illness and injury surveillance system in all sports. Okay, if we're working with a federation that doesn't have this, even if it's at the national level, try and institute this. Athletes should be monitored using subclinical signs of illness and selected special inv investigations. So the earliest thing that something is wrong with an athlete is just a feeling that their temperament is disordered, looking at daily monitoring, um, is, is one of those ways. We use something called a, a K10 uh, for signs of, of distress. Um, the United States team in Rio had a very good rapid analysis system where they pay $150. It's a panel 
where they actually get a specimen, they run it, and they're told if the infection is viral or if it is bacterial, and if it is bacterial, which bacteria it is. Athletes should be monitored for early signs of overreaching and overtraining, and this is where the coaches actually come into this as well. Sports psychology is also part of this, develop resilience strategies. Resilience can be learned. You can actually increase resilience scores in athletes through certain interventions. Educate athletes in stretch management techniques. We use mindfulness as an intervention with our group. And implement periodic stress assessments, e.g. Hassel and Uplift scale, and the Leska scale is going, and when there are times of increased home stress to reduce training and competition loads during those times. So this is a lot of recommendations. I urge you all to actually get the BJSM. This is an open access uh, article, and it's got a lot more information about these key pointers. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.